Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on ocean plastics with ICCR. Water pollution not only constrains social development and economic growth, but also damages important ecosystems around the world. Ocean and marine ecosystems are currently at risk. The ocean contains an estimated 150 million tons of plastic. One study predicted oceans will contain more plastic than fish by 2050 if no actions are taken to reduce the flow of plastics into waterways. Plastic ocean pollution injures and kills marine life and spreads toxins. It also poses a potential threat to human health. Why not squarely in the water work I staff at ICCR, which is focused on freshwater scarcity and pollution, I do think this is an important issue to raise awareness on, especially at a time where the environment is being relegated to the back seat and there are steps that we can take as consumers and as investor activists. Further, the engagement opportunities that Conrad will highlight overlap with uh, current ICCR engagements on other issues. On today's webinar, as you saw, is Conrad McCarran and Leah Colabello of uh, the Five Geyers Institute. She's the community and partnership director there. We'll dive into the ocean plastics problem and an approach to challenging companies to help solve this crisis. We invite you now to listen to their presentations and to join them in discussion by entering your questions or comments into the question box on your webinar panel. All lines will be placed on mute as we proceed with our presentation today. So without further ado, I'll pass things on to Leah uh, to kick us off. And Leah, just give a minute um, as there's a slight delay uh, in your presentation being shown. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. I'm with the Five Gyres Institute. We have been researching the world's oceans since 2009, trying to understand the quantity of plastic pollution that's out there. We are considered the premier researchers of this issue, and our research informs policy at organizations like the United Nations, we're founding members of the Global Program for Marine Litter, the World Bank, Congress, legislative bodies here in the United States and abroad. We also work with youth, consumers and companies to educate about what is clearly a global health crisis. Um, Nadira, I'm trying to advance my slide. Is it, is it going now? Yes, there Wonderful. It is, yep. Nadira touched on the fact that research has estimated that there are about 8 million metric tons of plastic that enters into the ocean every year. This is about a garbage truck a minute. Our research has shown that there are 5.2 trillion pieces of plastic just floating on the surface of the ocean alone. We do not yet know the quantity of plastic that's sunk to the bottom of the ocean, although some people say that maybe 50% of the plastic that has entered the ocean since it's begun flowing down our waterways um, is about 50%, as I mentioned. Plastic is hydrophobic. It's what makes it so valuable. It, it sheds water, but in doing so, um, it attracts toxic chemicals to it. So one piece of plastic drifting in the ocean can be a million times more polluted and contaminated with toxic chemicals than the water around it. And sadly, plastic is very desirable for fish and other marine animals. It is very easy to, you know, just kind of floats there. It's, it's easy to obtain for them. It's quite colorful and it looks like food. So where is all this plastic coming from? Well, in the United States, we have about a 70% uh, waste collection ratio where other countries have close to none. In this photo, this is a shanty town on the outskirts of a populated city. And that is a waterway that is flowing underneath the shanties. People don't have anywhere to put the plastic packaging that consumer goods come in, so they just literally toss it out the window. But then these rivers and streams in watersheds act as conveyor belts shooting plastic to our oceans. Children around the world are playing in plastic waters. And I was born in the 70s, and I can say that I am the last generation of my family to ever know a plastic-free beach or ocean, as I'm sure many of you on this call can say the same. It's tragic, and there is a big baseline that's shifting. Generations are now born only knowing beaches filled with plastic, and I've seen images and videos of 
people that are in their 20s or so throwing plastic garbage into the ocean because that's where plastic is coming from for them. They don't realize it's not supposed to be there. This young man, he's a waste picker, and Conrad is going to speak a little bit about the value of waste pickers in the plastics economy. He's on a boat in a bay um, outside in Indonesia. And here in the United States, this photo was taken in Charleston, South Carolina, where I live. And it demonstrates that plastic doesn't degrade readily. It will get beat up by wave action, the you know, photo degradation, as well as animals eating it. But no one really knows how long it will take plastic to degrade. There is so much of it. So it breaks down into these tiny, tiny pieces, especially when it gets out into the ocean, making it impossible to retrieve. This photo is taken from what is considered to be the most polluted beach in the world, or excuse me, the most polluted beach in the United States. And ironically, it is located in a very remote section of the big island of Hawaii. And that is because plastic, like from that earlier picture, most likely didn't originate from the local population in and around Hawaii, but it has drifted there, caught up in gyres, circular currents that are moving all throughout the world's oceans. There are five subtropical gyres, that's the name of our organization, because we, our initial mission was to investigate the quantities of plastic that are in these gyres. But what we found was it's impossible to retrieve, and we're calling it a plastic smog. There is no that idea of an island that's twice the size of Texas floating out there where you can send out a boat and pick up garbage readily, that, that's a myth. We are finding plastic everywhere. Indeed, it is more concentrated in the center of the gyres because the currents collect it there. But we also have accumulation zones like the Mediterranean Sea and the Bay of Bengal. So to continue with the plastic smog analogy, plastic is like a carbon. So it will, excuse me, plastic is a carbon. So like what we experience with carbon that's shooting out from smokestacks and polluting our atmosphere, we are considering our watersheds to be horizontal smokestacks shooting plastic, a carbon, out into the ocean where then it will break apart into such fine pieces. 90% of the plastic that we are finding out there is smaller than a grain of rice. We call them microplastics. And they are very easily integrated into our, our food systems. As I had mentioned in my very first slide, plastic attracts toxic chemicals. And this, exam this is an example. The more discolored the nurdle is in this photo, the more toxic chemicals have glommed onto it. So sadly, fish are eating it. It starts at zooplankton levels. We can see plastic within them. So a whale, a humpback whale, researchers in Vancouver Aquarium are saying, you know, can easily eat 300,000 pieces of plastic a day just by chasing its natural diet of copepods. They are saying uh, there's research in, sorry, there's research in the UK uh, based on, a, uh, out of Brussels, saying that if the standard uh, meal of mussels can have 90 pieces of microplastics in it, this is alarming because we eat shellfish whole. And the research actually indicated that based on a standard diet over a year, a person can in, um, ingest 11,000 pieces of microplastics just from consuming a standard diet of mussels. There is research showing that fish, and this is a fish that we caught in the North Pacific gyre. We estimated that this rainbow runner had three um, it was three months old, and it had 17 pieces of plastic in its belly. Recent research is showing that a quarter of the fish that have been tested source from markets in Indonesia as well as in Northern California, they, a quarter of those fish, had plastic in their gut. Now, with regards to the fact that plastic carries toxic chemicals, there is research that's being done in the Mediterranean, where they are tagging dolphins to try to understand about toxic transfer. And indeed, they are finding phthalates in the blubber of dolphins, 
which they believe is a derivative of the plastics that the dolphins are eating. This is another example. Um, all seven species of sea turtles encounter plastic because it looks like jellyfish to them. This was from the char this turtle uh, passed all of this plastic while it was in the care of the famed South Carolina Aquarium Sea Turtle Hospital. This happens regularly around the world. Turtles just washing up ashore, uh, very, very sick, if not dead, from ingesting plastics, as well as other marine mammals you see, um, and who knows how many other animals are affected. But it's not just limited to the oceans. Plastic pollution is everywhere. And this is what we, is a camel's bolus. The co-founder of Five Gyres, Marcus Erickson, happens to be a veteran from the first Gulf War. And he went back 20 years later, just last year, to find the deserts were littered in plastic. And as you go out into the deeper desert, you can actually see camel skeletons with just, with no meat on them, but just the, or sorry, not meat, but flesh, with just this bolus of plastic sitting in the middle of it. This specimen weighs 40 pounds and it is entirely plastic bags. Camel, camels are scavengers like many animals. So how did we get here with so much plastic out in the world and, and what can we do about it? Plastics really came into prominence as an incredibly useful material during World War II. And it's what we can consider, you know, nylon that uh, were for parachutes and all kinds of things for the war machine. But when the war ended, the plastics industry turned towards consumers. And this is really where our whole society shifted from something that was an incredibly thrifty, historic, you know, we saved for generations and generations and re -sewed our clothes and always brought our cups with us and silverware and things like that to a throwaway society. And you can see a shift starting in 1955. That is where 15, uh, in 1964, they say that uh, they were able to say 15 million tons of plastic was produced globally. Now we're up to 311 million tons of plastic. That's a 2014 number. This is the entire just plastic production globally. But what our organization is incredibly focused on is the fact that a quarter of this quantity is plastic packaging. Plastic packaging is designed to be used once before it's thrown away. So basically, there's research from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation saying 95% of plastic packaging is lost to our economy after only being used once, and it's this incredible waste that a lot of people are investigating and this as a concept called the circular economy. How can we keep this plastic from going into landfill or being burned or worse yet, slipping into the environment and leaking into our watersheds and oceans? Plastic is everywhere. A lot of people think of it as a single use, like your plastic water bottle or a plastic straw, plastic utensils, plastic bags. But when you go into the supermarket, you will see that literally plastic packaging is everywhere. So how can we work with this? Because here in the US, as I mentioned earlier, there is a garbage truck that comes down the street. But in other countries around the world, it's just you know, these open debris fields, where, debris fields where plastic will easily wash into the ocean after the next storm or major rain event. There is no place for many consumers to put the plastic that their goods come in. All of this costs an immense amount of money. So in, with regard to the end, obviously, for the environment and health and social implications, 600, more than 600 species of marine animals are affected by plastic through ingestion and entanglement. Plastics are everywhere. Here in the United States, we had some policy that actually are, is going to eliminate plastic microbeads out of personal care products, but we were finding them throughout our watersheds, especially in the Great Lakes, where they were highly concentrated. 
I touched briefly on the human health implications of plastic, with, uh, but it's a very elusive data yet, and scientists, that's sort of the next frontier of this issue, is studying the effects on humans of ingesting animals that have ingested plastic. And the fiscal costs are starting to really rack up. Uh, the numbers that we have from True Cost report that it is about $140 billion a year in costs for after-use impacts from plastic. That includes the pollution of air, land, and water, the ocean impacts, greenhouse gas emissions, and just other costs that are generated throughout the plastic value supply chain. The taxpayer burden in the LA Times reported that prior to the plastic bag ban bill that was just uh, the referendum that was just voted by uh, people out in California, uh, they were spending $425 million a year. The cities were spending almost a half a billion dollars a year to clean up plastic bags in California alone. So there are these immense costs that are not realized in the value of plastic upfront. With regards to tourism and fishing, there are some, is some data from the APEC region saying that the costs um, by litter to the shipping industry, you know, just out there floating around causing damage to ships and things like that, is 250 million a year, again, only in the APEC region. And then another report says tourism in the APEC region is affected by plastic pollution to the tune of $622 million a year. In the United States, there was, um, there, it's very hard to find these kind of economic data. Researchers are, re there's more papers that have been written about plastic pollution in the last two years than have been written in the last 20. So we're still sort of catching up with the realities here. But in, in New Jersey, I'll give you a, a kind of an estimate about the impacts here in the United States of plastic pollution. It's an older example. In 1988, a land, landfill debris started washing ashore on the Jersey Shore over the course, course of uh, two summers. And tourism declined there by 33%, which led to a, a loss of income by local businesses that is estimated to be $2 billion in today's money. That's a lot of loss for economic reasons which within just the Jersey Shore based on plastic pollution. This is a photo of the actor Jeremy Irons in a movie that he uh, was in called Trashed. And it's of a Lebanese beach that used to be famous for how beautiful and pristine it was. But this is an example where nobody has any place to send their plastic waste. And um, we're hoping to work with these countries on a variety of levels, and it's happening now, where the UN has launched a clean seas approach where 10 countries have looked to create policy that will help decrease the flow of single-use plastics into the watershed and eventually the oceans. There's a lot of studies happening right now about the social costs of, of plastic pollution, kind of the psychological costs, Nobody wants to go to a beach that is this dirty. But as I mentioned before, the baseline for acceptability of this is shifting. And now you can find children running and playing on beaches that are covered with trash like this all around the world. So what kind of solutions are there? There are four major ones that Five Gyres is participating in. One that isn't demonstrating to be particularly useful at this time is better downstream waste management. We have been advocating recycling at, for 40 years now, but nobody can keep up with the plastic that's coming down there. Plus, a lot of the plastic coming into the oceans are from countries that can't afford more sophisticated waste management and recycling systems. They have other priorities. How do we answer those questions? A lot of people are advocating for, hey, let's just burn and bury it. But to me, that is like putting, like an ostrich putting its head in the sand, ignoring the problem that is coming from upstream. So how can we shift that burden upstream? 
And this is where the consumer engagement aspects help telling people to you know, bring your own bag. You know, don't use straws, these sorts of things. Trying to get the easy plastics that readily leak into the environment out of our out of their out of consumer hands, really. Policy is incredibly successful in helping drive solutions, but it is takes years and to advocate for solutions, and we really don't have those that those years. The United States passed the Microbead Free Waters Act in 2015, which means by 2018, no companies can sell uh, products that contain these little plastic exfoliating microbeads in their personal care products. That helps disrupt the supply chain globally. And because of that policy, companies like Unilever and L'Oreal are realizing that they need to change their products that are sold throughout their global supply chain. So that is an example of how policy drives success through corporate change. But personally, I am a huge advocate of working with corporations to create design change with their products and packaging solutions. How can we find better materials that achieve the same success factors that are necessary for consumer goods to have? And there's so many wonderful work that is being done by corporations, corporations, excuse me, research labs in the United States and abroad, and I hope I'll get a chance to share some of those later in the talk. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation is a huge advocate for this concept of circular economy and to please bring back, create materials that will come back into play and be used over and over again so there is value in them so they won't leak into the environment. And that is truly, I think, the most immediate and most effective solution. Lastly, I wanted to point out um, with regards to policy as it intertwines with corporations. In Chile, they have passed something called an extender, extended producer law, like extended producer liability law. And so now they are working with companies that once a consumer uses that product, that product is collected and sent back to the company. So hopefully we'll get back to a place that a lot of people experienced prior to the 1970s where when you got a soda from the store, it came in a glass bottle or an aluminum can, and you drank the contents of it and then sent it back to the store where the distributor picked it up, took it to the factory, and either refilled the bottle or reused the aluminum can because those materials had such value. It would be wonderful if we could hit that opportunity again. Thank you. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to join you. Leah, thanks so much, and what incredible photos to, to tell the story. So we'll turn things over now to Conrad. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Are my visuals up there okay? It's there. Great. Well, thanks so much, Leah. It's been a pleasure to... Uh, work with the folks at Five Gyres over the last couple of years and get to know more about their work and, and uh, all the wonderful research and activities they've been involved with. So that's a great uh, prep for, for us moving into some discussion about corporate engagement and solutions. Um, a lot of the work that we're going to talk about is an extension of work that I've been doing that As You So has been leading for many years on trying to get companies to recycle more of their products and packaging. Uh, beverage companies, electronics, and, and more recently consumer goods companies. I want to build a bit on what uh, Leah discussed uh, on uh, the, the problem and then uh, talk about some opportunities uh, for engagement and invite you to join what uh, we intend to start as a coalition on, on plastic pollution solutions. Um, so why is this a big deal? You're all busy folks, you've got a lot of issues to deal with and uh, a lot of uh, a limited amount of time, so why prioritize this uh, with all the work that, that we do here in the sh shareholder engagement world? Well, as you just heard, there's already a current and established threat to the water quality and fish and birds, um, 
and projected huge growth in plastic production over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, we've now been able to verify a high volume of plastic dumping into the ocean, and uh, we have an, a potential environmental health issue with the transfer of toxics to fish tissue, although certainly that, that is research that's in progress. Uh, but there are some interesting links to climate change, uh, and given all the work that I know our community does on climate, I wanted to highlight those a bit first here. Um, the current use of oil to produce plastics and its content in plastics is equivalent to the aviation sector. It's about 6% uh, of total use. And their projections, again, are huge that this will become uh, up to 15% of the total carbon budget globally by 2050. So plastics is a big player in, in the climate equation. Um, and this graphic really drives that home. This is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation report, um, a landmark report which came out last year called The New Plastics Economy, Rethinking the Future of Plastics. And if you have interest in this area, please download this report. It's, it's a great resource in so many ways uh, of talking about the background and, and the setting the, the stage uh, why this is a priority. But just take a look at these four uh, sobering factors here. Plastics production is set to quadruple by 2050, basically going from 300 million tons to 1,100 metric tons. Um, and as we mentioned, there's this dramatic statistic that if nothing is done, more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2020. And as I just mentioned, the, the share of global oil consumption will increase from 6 to 20 percent, and carbons, a plastic share of that budget will increase from 1 to 15 percent. Uh, so with that as a background, you know, Ellen MacArthur has basically challenged us to take a look at um, our current linear model here, which this diagram shows of make, take, and waste. You can see it's pretty dramatic. 40% uh, of their waste is getting landfilled, and I think the most shocking statistic is just below that. 32% of waste never makes it even to a landfill, which isn't, of course, ideal, but at least it keeps it out of harm's way in theory. Uh, it's leaking into the environment, and that's why we have, that's really the core of the problem here. It's littered on land and then swept into the ocean or waterways, and this goes to the problematic recycling system that Leah mentioned and that I'm going to touch on more in a minute. But um, right now we're stuck with this linear model. And here's the goal to really to move to a circular model. And uh, that is what uh, Ellen MacArthur's work is all about. Um, if any of you have heard her speak at series or other events, really moving to a circular economy. Three big points here. One is you need to create an effective after-use economy. You, you have to give that plastic value if it's going to be collected. Um, you need some place to go if it's going to be processed. So companies or <clears throat> investors have to step forward and uh, build uh, economics of value for, for this waste plastic. Um, second, we've got to reduce the leakage uh, by a number of ways we'll get into in a minute. And third, we need to really view uh, changing the source of the feedstock uh, from fossil fuels to other options, biofuels, etc. Um, widely known here is really that over the past 10 years or so, uh, the, the cheap fracking of oil and gas here in the United States has led to huge expansions. Uh, in our U.S. chemical facilities. Um, and as I, the slide just showed a moment ago, that's, that's plastic production is set to quadruple. Ethylene is extracted from natural gas uh, to make polyethylene, which is the um, major ingredient in bottles and plastic bags and fast food trays and diapers and so much plastic in our society. These facilities, like the one on the lower right here, are ethylene crackers that, that crack um, ethane down to ethylene and so that polyethylene can be man, uh, manufactured. And so there is a direct link here between 
cheap natural gas, uh, cheap fracking and all the environmental concerns and water concerns associated with it, and cheap plastic, um, which is one of the reasons why so much of our society is moving towards plastic. Just one example, if we were to move uh, to bio-based sourcing as opposed to fossil fuel sourcing, you can see here an example of how much dramatically less greenhouse gases would be emitted with bio-based polymers than petroleum-based polymers. This is also from the New Plastics Economy Report. Of course, there are a lot of concerns with this. Um, feedstocks, you don't want to be competing with food crops like corn or sugar. You'd prefer to have naturally occurring biopolymers um, like cellulose and starch. Um, but certainly that's some, a path we need to, to head down and uh, as, as we think about uh, the impacts of climate and, and its link to plastics. So the global solutions, if we take a step back here, um, as Leah teed up earlier, we really need to dramatically improve the recycling systems globally. And uh, there was a, a study uh, done by in Science Magazine um, a couple of years ago that said that about 60% of plastic waste is believed to be coming from five countries, developing countries in Asia, as you can China, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. And so uh, the Ocean Conservancy and others are looking at developing solid waste systems, collection and recycling systems in these countries or enhancing what's there over, over the next few years. So that is a short-term priority, is, is to go to these key countries and, and improve solid waste collection to the point where you reduce and hopefully eventually cut off the, the flow of plastics in, into land and water. But that's uh, recycling is not enough. Uh, I think it's important to hammer home that fact. Uh, we do need to reduce plastic use overall, especially single-use plastic, and to decouple the plastic from fossil feedstocks. So how does that translate into the work we can do as shareholder activists and in engagement with companies? Our work has focused on packaging for many years. Um, again, as Leah mentioned, 25% of plastics production is packaging. It's the single largest application. Um, it's also important to work on because it's an area where you have a high potential for readily substituting other materials that won't cause harm in the ocean. Um, we also want to promote more recyclable packaging. I'll we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, extended producer responsibility. Really, this is the core of so much of this because it's about who's going to pay for all this. It's all well and good to say we need to put in new recycling systems in developing countries, but the reason that they don't have them often is because they can't afford them. And there's really only two sources, taxpayers and companies. And right now, taxpayers are paying most of this, and they're paying all of it here in the United States. Whereas in other countries, she mentioned Chile, but also in the European Union, in Canada, in about 40 other countries, except for the United States, OECD countries, producer responsibility is the law or some variation of it. And uh, that's something we've worked on in the past few years. Unfortunately, here in the U.S., we still have uh, taxpayers picking up all the costs, and companies are basically going scot-free. Um, the other priorities are to look at polystyrene foam phase-out because polystyrene is one of the easy bad actors we can get rid of. It's got alternatives. We'll see in a moment. And um, there's already over 100 bans in cities in the United States for it. Um, and then we get into the harder issues, redesign of non-recyclable pouches and sachets, uh, transition to refillables and reusables, and overall plastics reduction. Again, uh, in this graphic, Ellen MacArthur has done a nice job of, of showing visually where we need to go. The bottom 50%, that we're basically saying if we can f optimize our recycling systems, we can greatly improve this to the point where we've got 50% of the material um, already out there getting recycled. About 20% of it can be, of the problem can be fixed by making materials into reusable or refillable containers. And then the harder part really, perhaps, fundamental redesign and innovation for the last 30%. So that's, that's a good um, overall graphic for where we need to go. Um, but here's a reminder of the problem that we've been working on for about 15 years. We don't. This is the 
recycling rates in the United States. We're doing pretty well on paper and steel and aluminum, okay, but we should be doing much better. But down there on the right, plastic packaging, it's now about 14%, but that's the problem. It lags uh, greatly. Uh, both the U.S. and global rates for plastic packaging are about uh, 14%. And as we talk about building um, waste systems in developing countries, um, I just want to take a moment here to look at some of the challenges that we have. Um, it's probably unlikely that it's going to be the same model as here in the United States, again, because of the lack of funding. And um, these countries are now facing issues like, do we go with traditional, highly centralized systems like having waste management or some other large conglomerate or public services take all of this and deal with it? Or do we have local cooperatives doing new zero waste models as uh, we're seeing in the Philippines and other countries? Uh, we have to make the low value plastics valuable. We have to make it worth the while of, of whoever's recycling it, whether it's a big company or a local cooperative. It has to have value. Someone else has to want that that they can sell it to. So the economics have to change. And again, the key thing, who's going to finance this? And this comes back to our belief that corporations have to sh shoulder at least some of the responsibility. Another overlooked issue is that there are really millions of, of waste pickers, desperately poor people who manage to make a living by collecting waste. There's about a million and a half in India alone. As a result, India has a 90% PET recycling rate versus 30% here in the United States, and yet it's built on this poverty. And as we transition into more formal systems, we want to ensure that those people still have opportunities. So here is what's happening. Um, the pouch is taking over. <laughs> the plastic pouch, if you go into your Whole Foods, if you go into your grocery store, materials that used to be in more recyclable materials shown on this slide are now all packaged in multi-material laminate pouches as we call them. And if you look at these four examples uh, from a, a soup can to a box of raisins to um, baby food and detergent, all of them on the, the left hand example readily recyclable materials. The right hand pouch that has replaced them, designed for the dump, designed for the landfill, not recyclable. So that is really the problem. Uh, so many materials <clears throat> are being taken over by the pouch. It's now the second largest form of packaging after corrugated. It's basically beating out metal and paperboard, glass, and even other kinds of rigid plastics. And $34 billion in annual sales uh, of these flexible packaging materials and it has some good attributes. It, it certainly takes fewer greenhouse gases to produce, um, but that's not the only part of the profile. The problem, of course, is that it's not recyclable on the back end. So what have we done? We have, we have engaged uh, companies to make their packaging recyclable over the last couple of years as the first piece of this work. So we've gotten commitments from Colgate Palmolive to make um, most of their packaging recyclable by 2020. They're still working on the Toothpaste tube, that's a hard one, but they are trying. Uh, that's another example of a multi-laminate material that's never been recycled. Uh, we also got Procter & Gamble to commit to a 90 percent, uh, to make 90 percent of their packaging by 2020 recyclable. And uh, just last uh, month, or back in January, Unilever committed, although it's over a bigger time frame, to get 100 percent of their packaging uh, recyclable or compostable. So that's a great um, commitment by a, a big uh, corporate leader and although we'd like to see the time frame uh, shorter. We have had some small successes. We uh, talked to Honest Kids, which is a um, another juice pouch uh, similar to Capri Sun and um, after discussing the concerns with them, they, they have begun to transition back to a more recyclable material. Uh, this carton here you see on the right hand side, about 40 percent of the volume now is back to that material. 
But here's what we're doing this year in terms of our shareholder advocacy work. Uh, we are engaging these three companies on the recyclability issue, Mondelay, Kraft, and Kroger, Kraft Heinz and Kroger. We have shareholder proposals asking them to make more of their packaging recyclable. Um, on the foam issue, we, uh, we had success several years ago with McDonald's uh, where we were able to get them to commit to phase out of foam cups in the United States. However, it, there's still a little bit of it out there uh, we're finding, especially in these vulnerable areas we find in Hong Kong and the Philippines, and so we're asking them to finish the job by phasing out foam globally. And continuing on the theme of polystyrene, a lot of it's in packaging material that doesn't need to be there, and so we've engaged these, these giant e-commerce e companies, Amazon and Walmart and Target, to say, let's get this material out of your system as well. When this crumbles and goes on the beaches, it just creates havoc for, for fish and birds, as we've learned. There's, in many cases now, there's no need for it. There's re readily available alternatives. IKEA and Dell have already started to phase out, and so we are in dialogue with these companies, and we do have proposals pending uh, um, at these uh, two companies. Uh, Amazon actually has been withdrawn. Uh, we've seen some progress, but we are um, going to continue this work uh, of, of engaging these big big companies. Uh, but the hard work here is uh, the redesign of non-recyclables. Here is the situation in much of the developing world. Unlike the U.S. where you go in and buy a, <clears throat> a bottle of shampoo or cleaner, um, m the big multinationals market these as these small pouches that you can see here in this picture. Uh, you just tear off one of them and it's a single serve of a of a shampoo. Uh, and while this may be convenient and more affordable, it does create more waste because if you're just using these and throwing them out, it the waste does does pile up. And so um, these materials have to be redesigned to become recyclable or we need to find alternatives to them. And we've been talking with Unilever about this. Uh, the other uh, focus of, of concern, of course, is refillables and reusables. Uh, the, the Starbucks has done some good work on this domestically. Uh, we've worked with them on this and they've made a commitment to use 25% um, to serve 25% of beverages in refillable bottles. Unfortunately, they weren't able to make that goal. Um, they dropped it down to 5% and they're still struggling to do it. We don't think they should give up though. You know, a lot of this is behavioral change. About at least half of it is consumers having to pay attention to their behavior and their habits. Um, but the other half is companies making it convenient and publicizing it and incentivizing people with, with discounts. Uh, but this also needs to happen with beer bottles. In a lot of countries, uh, in Canada and Germany, the beer bottles are standardized, or, or at least they were for a while, so that they could be refilled by whichever company uh, ended up with them after they were collected. Um, and, and in some cases, you still see milk bottles um, that are that are still uh, collected as, and can be refilled with, and with deposits. Um, so some of the existing initiatives. Uh, I want to wrap up here, so we have some time for questions. If you're interested in this, I urge you. If you want to dig deeper, here are uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, as I mentioned. These these new economy reports, new plastics economy reports, are on their website. They they really give you a lot of better background on this. Um, in terms of kind of a joint corporate uh, environmental partnership, we're seeing the Trash Free Seas Alliance and Ocean Conservancy working together on solutions. We're not really happy with, with all of what they're doing, but they a lot of it is very good and, and we're in agreement with much of it. And again, you should look at a report called Stemming the Tide that came out last year. Um, some of the controversy there is about how much we should burn or not as part of this solution, and we are certainly of the opinion we should not be burning um, at all, if possible, and that uh, we should really be looking at alternatives that build this circular economy model that we were discussing. Uh, the American Chemistry Council is doing a little bit of work testing sorting technologies for these flexible packages I mentioned that have kind of taken over the market, these pouches and sachets. Uh, really what you need to do is be able to sort them. You know, if we're going to put them in people's uh, curbside containers, you need to sort them and then uh, be able to segregate them at high volume and then find a company that can process them. 
Um, in terms of the NGO activity, um, some things that are coming up. Uh, Break Free from Plastic is a campaign that uh, launched last year, and they have a website you can look at. They will be bringing uh, campaigns out over the next um, year, I believe. I, I believe you'll actually see a big multinational targeted. I'm not sure, but I think that will happen with, with a major environmental group uh, later this year. So I think that uh, we'll also see, uh, if you aren't aware of a group called Gaia, um, is a international coalition that promotes zero waste in cities, a zero waste model but without burning. Uh, they're doing a lot of important work. I would check out their website. And then groups like Five Gyres, Plastic Pollution Coalition, Story of Stuff, all doing great research on the problem and uh, potential solutions out there. So for us as investors, where do we go? What can happen? As you so would like to develop something along the lines of a Plastic Solutions Investor Alliance, a group of investors that could get together, uh, engage a group of companies, uh, file proposals if necessary on what I call the four R's that really are core to the solutions from our perspective. Fixing recycling, uh, redesign when materials uh, can't be properly recycled, promoting reuse, and at, at the core, waste reduction, which is probably the hardest issue. And and uh, but as as we see that the growth rate of plastics is so large, we have to encourage companies at the end of the day to make better materials choices in the future, especially if it's single-use plastics. If you're going to use a cup for two minutes and then it sits in a landfill for 200 years, that just doesn't make sense and it's not a great use of materials. So there has to be a lot of engagement about wise use of resources. And even though greenhouse gases is an important factor, I, I do uh, have issues when companies just trot out greenhouse gases as the major and often only factor for these choices. Uh, that's why I think we can play a role of saying you have to look at the whole life cycle, and as we're seeing, if if this gets, if this avoids the waste system, it can do a lot of damage in the environment. So I'd like to look at engaging four big players, and if many of you hold these companies or would just like to be on as part of this, uh, we would welcome groups who would like to participate uh, with Nestle, Procter and Gamble, Pepsi, and Unilever. Um, these are companies uh, we have had relationships with and that we want to build long-term uh, relationships and, and if possible partnerships with to look at these uh, four R issues that I mentioned above. Um, of course, Pepsi and Procter & Gamble are domestic and um, in some ways easier to talk with. Nestle and Unilever, I think it's important to have a big group if possible because it's it's really unrealistic to file shareholder proposals with them. It's I think it's more important to have a a big group of of allies who are interested in in engagement. Uh, but these are all global companies that are marketing in these developing countries where a lot of these problems are are happening that we've we've shown here this morning. So some more opportunities. Uh, we think uh, there's a possibility of doing some site visits to zero waste cities that are model um, cities as we get down the road. Uh, there's also uh, the possibility of those of you who work with impact investors or have impact investing as part of your uh, own portfolio of responsibilities or services, uh, there will become opportunities to finance solid waste collection in developing countries. Uh, again, Ocean Conservancy just put out a, a report about that called the next wave, if you're interested, that has, again, some things we dis we agree with, some things we're not <clears throat> totally in agreement with, but, but a lot of it is very constructive uh, information about how impact investors can help finance some of these solutions. And uh, also, microfibers is, a, is a, an emerging concern. We didn't even really talk about that, but uh, microfibers come off of clothing, synthetic clothing, and they get into the water as these are, are washed, and now they're in the Great Lakes, and they're in a lot of the oceans. So an engagement with the apparel industry uh, may be on the horizon as well. There's a, a video that story of stuff just put out called the story of microfibers that, that talks about this. Um, next steps, uh, again, uh, we would love to plant some seeds of interest here. For those of you, whether you can do a little or a lot from participating regularly in calls to occasional participation to uh, signing on letters and statements. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, sorry I went over a little bit, but hopefully this has uh, 
we have some good questions, and I'd be happy to take um, take questions. And thanks so much for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you to to Leah and Conrad uh, for laying the foundation of of the issue. Um, and we do have a few questions um, that I will get to now. Uh, so the first one, Conrad, you mentioned Procter and Gamble uh, making a commitment, uh, Colgate Palmolive. Did the uh, commitments they make is that global or is it uh, U.S. only? It's global. Yep, it's it's global, and so that is um, for yeah for all their markets. Great. And one of our uh, participants on the line said that she's dealing with similar concerns within the Great Lakes in Michigan. Are there any resources of studies done with plastics in that basin? There are many. If that, um, if that person would like to contact me, I can share reports of it. We just also had a microfibers webinar and if they would like to access that, I can send the link to the webinar so they can learn a little bit more. Great. Are there any business opportunities for companies that can develop and produce alternative packaging products? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Many. Um, I, Conrad and I had, to, and we had talked a little bit about what kind of solutions are there, especially in the world of bio materials, bio, what people call bioplastics, that won't compete with food crops. And there are definitely so many. So Ecovative, they are making packaging out of mushrooms. They're based in New York, northern New York. They have a deal, I think they've got the deal with Dell, isn't that right, Conrad? The Dell is yeah. using their, yep. Right. Uh, they, the gentleman that is sort of running that show, he actually was an investment banker in New York City. And four years ago, he this opportunity, the company pitched to them, to, and he jumped ship from investment banking and now is just taking that company huge international. There is a company called Full Psycho Bioplastics that it's in its early stages yet. And this is a very interesting company that is creating a type of material called PHA. It's different than PLA, which is corn-based type of that sugar uh, base, like beets and things like that, uh, based feedstock. This is made out of compost. So this has full circular economy implications. They're starting to produce materials and testing the different types of applications, which then would transfer into what a, the packaging needs would be. Uh, they are going to be speaking at a conference here in Charleston, March 30th, called Breaking Down Plastic. If anyone would like information about that conference, I'm happy to speak to that. There's a company in Europe called Arkema, A-R-K-E-M-A, and they are looking at the castor plant as a feedstock for a bioplastic, biomaterial. The castor plant grows in very arid conditions, in very impoverished locations, mostly in India. It doesn't compete for, as a food source, and it, it has some very interesting applications as well. And then there is a company in Orange County called New Light Technologies, and they are making green, they are making a type of plastic out of greenhouse gas. So I'm not, you know, it's all kind of secretive. I don't know kind of how they're doing it. But they're also um, an interesting, they're still, they're, they're still growing. But you might have seen them on like the Today Show or some major news outlets. A very young person runs that organization. And those are four that come to mind right now. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I would just add that I noticed, note that uh, ICCR will be having its AGM in Grand Rapids, I believe, later this year. And if, if there is interest, I'm sure we could find uh, researchers working on plastics in the Great Lakes who could provide information if you wanted to have someone come and speak. Um, it might be a, a good, good opportunity. Great. Thanks, Conrad. A few others. Um, besides California, what are some other states that have been progressive on plastic recycling? That is a challenging question. Right now, we are facing preemptive legislation in a variety of states. I would have, two years ago, I would have told you that states like 
Michigan were off the charts with regards to encouraging recycling. They have a 10 cent bottle uh, fee that encouraged so much recycling that 90% of the bottles sold in Michigan were recycled. But lately we are seeing um, the plastics industry move forward with legislation that are bans on local communities kind of having municipal ordinances. So for example here in South Carolina, two little cities, Folly Beach and Isle of Palms, noticed that people were leaving a lot of trash behind as they left the beach, especially plastic bags and styrofoam coolers and things. So they created municipal ordinances that were, they deferred, you know, fees versus bans and things like that. But this is an example of what's happening in states everywhere around the U.S. where once a little town puts up in place an ordinance that limits the sale or the ability to even have these small plastic items that easily leak into the environment, industry introduces preemptive legislation that basically says no city can or municipal, municipality can um, act, enact um, a bag or a auxiliary container law, like against auxiliary containers, mm -hmm. which is so massive. Auxiliary containers could be a bottle, a bag, a styrofoam clamshell container, these sorts of things. So there's actually a lot of regression in that area with regards to the fact that the people are saying, there's a problem here, let's address it. And then state legislatures that are um, kind of taking, taking uh, I guess, kind of cutting off the voice of the people through this type of preemptive legislation. And I, I would just add quickly that um, certainly bag bans, uh, styrofoam bans are very useful um, tools uh, and help get people motivated to alternatives but a lot of the a lot of the long-term solutions um, that we need to build in really can't be done just with plastics you have to fix the whole recycling system and, and that makes it more complicated because it means you're dealing with all these other materials that you put in your recycling bin aluminum glass plastic paper and so forth for a lot most of that you have to be Plastic has to be dealt with in the context of all of that waste and how it gets sorted once it's collected. And so it does mean this this more macro view of how do we fix our our recycling system for for all the all the uh, packaging materials that that are commonly collected. Yeah, recycling really is on a downswing here in the United States because the cost of oil is so cheap um, that there are a lot of um, facilities, recycling facilities are actually closing because they can't afford to stay open. And so uh, apparently it's when oil reaches the price of $60 a barrel, then using recycled plastic. And so we need to create that market. Using recycled plastic becomes financially achievable. And, and that goes back to what I think is really the core issue. If you were to reduce all of these to one big, one big uh, a bottom line is who's going to pay for all this. And as I mentioned, this issue of producer responsibility is still in play here in the United States. There's an, there's an EPR for packaging law currently sitting in the Connecticut legislature and there will probably be one later here in California this year so it will be interesting to see these may be the first two states to pass an EPR law later this year although I'm not betting on it but, but I think that kind of progress needs to happen to show that producer responsibility can work here in the United States. That would open up a lot more of resources to pay for these kinds of systems to fix recycling because as, as mentioned I don't think we can really finance them just based on taxes because cities have so many other priorities that they're dealing with. I see that we're, we're almost at time but there are three other questions so I'll just go ahead and read off those three questions and Leah and Conrad um, feel free to answer um, as you can. So the first one, are there micro business opportunities for low income people in the five countries that you mentioned that produce 60% of the ocean plastic that could reduce plastic and poverty at the same time? The next one up is, what are the alternatives to the plastic bags for produce in grocery stores? And the final question, is there or has there been any federal legislation on this issue? So uh, I'll take the first one, uh, I'll take a quick shot at no federal legislation. The tradition here in the United States is that almost all of this is dealt with at the federal 
or I'm sorry, at the state or municipal level, and that's by design. EPA delegated all that authority to the states, so no, there's there's very little going on. Only federal grants to states to finance this. Um, and uh, Leah, I don't know if you want to comment on the others. Um, with regards to alternatives, that was for shopping bags, plastic shopping bags. Yes, yeah. Nadira. Okay, so basically 50% of the world's population lives under some kind of bag ordinance, plastic bag, uh, plastic shopping bag ordinance, because they are, you know, these governments are recognizing that there is so, if they're so easily lost into the environment, wreaking such havoc. In fact, the EU has a requirement, I think by 2020 or so, like 70% of the plastic shopping bags need to be reduced in their countries. So alternatives are, um, if I used to live in Europe before the plastic shopping bag rise came to be, and people would actually bring their own shopping carts with them and put them put their groceries straight in there without any bags. Here in the US, paper bags are an alternative solution, but the best thing is actually just bring your own canvas bag that can be easily washed. In Costco, when you go there, they don't have shopping bags, just cardboard containers for you to take things home if you don't bring your own bag. So those are quick alternatives for you. With regards to micro-business opportunities, I mean, I can only think of like waste pickers, really, right? There's the intermediate of waste pickers. Conrad, can you, can you touch that, on that? That's an evolving area that's all being developed. I would encourage you to read this next wave report um, and also look at the Gaia website. Uh, they are working with a lot of communities worldwide, including many of the developing countries. I wouldn't say there's an ideal program right off the shelf that I could cite, but I think uh, there's a lot of wonderful work going on at the local and community level that that um, that is uh, a work in progress. And I would say finally here, because I know we're at the end of the time, if you're interested in this, please um, contact me, give us a call, or, or certainly talk to Nadira and let us know if you're interested, and we will be happy to discuss uh, how we can all work together on this. And I just want to thank ICCR and thank you all so much for uh, your attention and the great questions. and. Um, Look forward to working with some of you as we uh, work on this important issue. Great. Special thanks to Conrad McCarran of As You So and to Leah Colabello of the Five Gyres Institute. Thank you both for, for taking us through this very important issue. And of course, thanks to our participants who asked uh, great questions. There were a couple of more that came in, um, so I'll send them to you, Conrad and Leah, um, so that you can follow up the speakers. The recording of this webinar will be available shortly and I'll share it with you all in case you need to share it with your colleagues um, and feel free to, uh, to share um, uh, broadly so that we can get others interested in the issue. Thanks everyone. I'll also share uh, Leah and Conrad's uh, contact information for you to get in touch. Thanks again for joining. Have a great day. Thank you.